All right. Good evening, team. How are you? Glad you okay. are here. Welcome to Soul Care. As people continue to come in, if you just make sure you grab uh, the handout uh, so that you can take notes. Uh, we love the setup in here because it's a table. You can take notes and we get the leftover dessert. So what could be better than that? All right. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Still have a few people coming in. Pray for us, and we will jump into uh, depression part two. Okay, depression part two. Um, this is a two-part series that was begun last week. We've walked through a number of important mental health issues. Um, and so just as a, a way of reminder, uh, all of these are being recorded uh, and so you can, you can catch up online and you can uh, download notes. Those notes should be right next to the recording online and, and all of those things. Uh, also, by way of, of quick reminder, this, this is a two-part, and we talked about depression again last week. Uh, and we opened up with a disclaimer about uh, uh, pastoral and biblical counseling and kind of the lane that we're in in, in terms of... Uh, uh, we talked about uh, medical conditions, and Tim listed out a number of those, and uh, medication, and, and hear us clearly. Uh, keep consulting your medical professionals and keep taking your medication. Uh, so many times medication is an important tool that allows you to, to deal with uh, some of the issues and some of the past hurt and a lot of the things that we're talking about. So uh, we say all of that as clarification of the lane that we are in. That way we can have freedom to, to speak and to be uh, heard and understood in that lane, okay? Um, if you have any more questions about that, we're happy to answer it at the end. Uh, let me pray for us, and then I'll turn it over to Tim, and we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word and for your nearness uh, that you have created us and uh, um, that you care so deeply for us that you are a God who draws near and that your word has spoken so intimately to our souls and uh, that, that when your word through your spirit uh, it, it is able to, to separate and able to help us. It, it is such an amazing work of your spirit to be able to pinpoint and, and, and to put our minds on uh, the cause and the source of issues and, uh, and, and where uh, so much anxiety and depression comes from. And, and so, Father, I, I pray for us to be able to continue to learn uh, and to be able to... Uh, be incredible, uh, godly friends uh, as the body of Christ, as we reach out to those around us who are dealing with such uh, difficult and heavy issues, God, that you would be equipping us as your people uh, to be able Jesus. to handle that as the body of Christ, um, as well as each of us individually in this room to be able to, uh, what a work of the Spirit to be able to, to put our finger on issues, God, that, that you are calling us to deal with and that you want to bring uh, healing and hope on the other side. And we pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. Thank you for returning. You guys are per persevering through this. Um, I want to sort of, I was thinking this afternoon about when I was in, in a very dark place and Elaine and I, we're, we're just young people. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, but we, we know Jesus and we know his word. And I remember... Elaine saying to me at one point, because we had no answers. We, had, we, we didn't know how to get out of that dark place. And she said, you know, I don't understand, but I am going to stay right here. and We're going to figure this out together. God's going to show us. And he, he sure did. And that, I held on to that uh, for dear life. So I'm just so thankful. Uh, if, if you are going through something and you have not reached out to someone who who you know cares about you deeply, you should do that. Because even though that person may not have the answers, the support and the camaraderie of being with someone walking through a difficult time is more than you could ever uh, know. The value of it is more than you would ever know. 
Okay, so let me review quickly what we, what we covered last week. We said that depression is a feeling of hopelessness. Uh, we could say that depression is a perception of hopelessness, especially for a believer, because a believer is never without hope, but it, he or she might be perceiving it that way. We said everyone is susceptible to depression. We looked at some biblical examples of depression. And we talked about how the roots of depression could be anything from fear, anger, shame, a number of things. And that the depression is the place we find ourselves because we haven't managed those internal struggles well. So we become very uh, depressed. I want to start tonight by looking at two different life orientations. It's very important when, when we look at emotional struggles. In my experience and from what I've read, people who struggle emotionally are usually going to fall into the feelings-oriented category. Not completely, but more so. So as we go through these comparisons, just do a mental check on your own life and say, you know, which category do I typically fall in? So when we compare these two, the feelings-oriented person approaches life and uh, uh, his or her feelings define reality. I don't know if you've ever, you know, thought it was Sunday when it was Saturday. How many of you thought that? It really felt like Sunday, right? <laughs> but it wasn't Sunday. The fact was it was Saturday, but your feelings said, oh no, it's Sunday. Uh, that's a, a very simple example of what this is like. You feel like something is real, but in reality, it may not be real. A commandment-oriented person allows God's word to define reality. And when we talk about identity next week, and when we talk about trauma and how shame feeds into trauma, this particular point becomes very, very important that we allow God's word to define our reality, not our experience, not our emotions. The feelings-oriented person will allow their feelings to dictate their choices, whereas a uh, commandment-oriented person will let God's word do that, or obedience to God's word. So the feelings-oriented person puts so much authority in their emotions that they, they really have a hard time Denying, denying them. They really feel like they're doing something wrong if they deny what they're feeling. So it's very important as you are going through emotional struggles or if you're walking with someone who's going through emotional struggles. Uh, the commandment-oriented person is going to uh, allow obedience to dictate his or her choices. So the reason I'm making this choice is not because I feel like making it, but because I know this is what God's word teaches me to do. So that's a faith choice. The feelings-oriented person feels like their emotions have to be served. Again, there's a certain loyalty attached to their emotions, and they're very conflicted if you advise them to do something against their emotions. Whereas a feelings, I'm sorry, a commanded-oriented person feels like, you know, regardless of how I feel, I have to serve God. That's my position. That's my desire. That's my motivation. A feelings-oriented person is motivated, motivated by the worship of self, meaning, worship meaning, the elevation of self. The, the big question for this person is, what is best for me? What do I think is best for me? What's going to make this better for me? The commandment-oriented person certainly wants to know what's better for them, but they are also thinking, okay, I am, uh, I'm worshiping God. I'm dedicated to the Lord, and I'm, I want to serve Him, uh, even if it costs me. The feelings-oriented person seeks to please him or himself or herself. This means I, I want to please my desires. I want to comfort myself. It's, it's all about prioritizing self. And when you're in a survival space, then that seems to be the natural thing to do is to protect yourself or to bring some sense of relief to yourself. 
But the commandment-oriented person, though he or she may feel all of those things as strongly as the feelings-oriented person, there is a, a, an intentional choice to make a decision based upon seeking to please the Lord and not themselves. Feelings-oriented person uh, to be... Wait a minute. I'm way, up, way ahead of myself. Oh, I didn't put that one in there. Uh, thank you. Got to talk to my, my slide person, see if they can't get that right. My, uh, the, the feelings-oriented person, to be feelings-oriented requires no faith. I don't have to have faith for this. To be commandment-oriented requires that I exercise a decision, my will, to do what God is leading me or teaching me to do. Um, the feelings-oriented person is carnally minded or earthly minded. It's all about what we can see and feel and touch and sense in our senses. Uh, the commandment-oriented person is more spiritually minded, more eternally focused, wanting to align his or her life with the purposes of God. Now, it's a very simple comparison. And I want you to think about, you know, how do I normally function in life? Am I relying on my emotions usually? Or am I relying on the Word of God? And so this comparison can be helpful as we're walking through an emotional struggle. So in our last session, we looked at this diagram and we talked about how uh, when a person responds wrongfully, inappropriately, sinfully to a particular set of circumstances, then that begins a downward spiral, you begin to feel things like guilt, shame, uh, discouragement, maybe sorrow. And then because this turmoil is in the person, another mistake is made by responding to what's going on internally. And the spiral continues to go down until the person falls into this space of despair or depression. So this is where we left us last week at this uh, particular place. So, so tonight we want to look at how we can reverse this process. How can we come out of depression? And I just want to say that there is no timeline for this. So and if you're in a hurry, that probably won't be working for you. Uh, th these things happen. I don't know. How, I don't know about the timeline. I just know that it's a battle of, of faith. So once you begin to move out of depression and you begin to believe the truth, then you have a day or a couple days where you doubt again. And so you might sink back down to, to some degree. And so there might be some ebb and flow to this process. So I want you to be aware that you are not failing if you are having setbacks in this process. This is a normal, natural process, and it has to work itself out. In, the, in a way that you can uh, pace yourself in it. And so, the, so to solve the problem of dep depression, we have to reverse this process. So this is gonna require courage, it's gonna require faith, it's gonna require me doing the things that I didn't want to do in the first place, right? So when I had a choice, I could have or should have done the right thing and addressed it biblically, I chose not to took the easy path. And, and so I'm going to have to circle back at some point and start doing this hard work. Now, that's not good news to a person who is depressed and feeling really, really low, low energy, low emotionally, but that is going to have to take place. So let me repeat that depression is not necessarily a feeling as much as it is a position. So we are depressed and we need to come out of that depression. So ideally, if we, we lived in a perfect world, a per perfect Christian Sunday school world, this is how uh, this process would work. Something happens. We process it through a lens of grace and faith through the Word of God. We are spiritually minded. We respond in a Christ-like manner, which increases our hope, which strengthens up us, with in, encourages us, and we are glorifying God through this process 
of making really good biblical obedient choices in the face of these circumstances. That's the ideal. This is what we're hoping for. This is what we're working toward, to walk in the Spirit so that this, this could, our lives can glorify God. So when a person is at this place of depression, hope has to be inserted or introduced. Now let me just say, hope seems to have the same DNA as faith. Now faith is right now, hope is for the future. But the, the DNA, the quality of it is the same. So when we hope in God, we are actually believing that somehow, in some way, God's going to work this out. I, don't, I may not know how that he's going to work that out, but I believe it, I know it, and I choose to trust him to do that. That's, that's the place hope is inserted to where we begin to believe I can overcome these things. I can, I can have a better existence. I can walk in God's truth and in his peace. Lord, help me to do this. So once hope is embraced, the person is now in a much better position to make better choices, better decisions about what's happening internally. Because this is where the battle is. The battle is not in our circumstances. The battle is within us in the way we are thinking. It's what we're focusing on. That's, the, that's where the work has to be done. So the individual at some point needs to move from a feelings-oriented posture over to a commandment-oriented posture. And what that means is that I have to begin to think, okay, regardless of what I feel, I am going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to take God at his word. That requires, again, faith and courage. Now, eventually in this process, this depressed person will have to address the root of the depression, whatever is fueling it, whatever uh, brought them to this depressed state. What issue was mishandled in the first place? Or what was it that brought me to this place of depression? Uh, that is going to have to be revisited. So depression, by definition, is really not the root problem. It is certainly a problem. It is certainly a consequence of the root problem. But we got to the place of depression because we didn't deal with the root appropriately. So the symptom cannot be addressed and with hopes of solving. In other words, I can't, I can't treat my depression, my sadness, in order to get beyond depression. In other words, I can't sleep more, that's not gonna help my depression. I can't eat more or eat less, that's not gonna help my depression. I can't avoid people and places that won't, that won't help my depression. I am going to have to face some things, right? All right, so we are going to have to address the lies we believe. Now let's look at Psalm 42. And just let me say from this second slide, as we consistently make obedient choices, we're spiritually minded, we're walking in the Spirit, we're walking in God's Word, then we begin to gradually come out of depression to a, to a better place. So listen to the psalmist. We looked at this last week, but I want to look at it again, where he asks, Psalm 42, 5, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. A couple of definitions. Uh, the, the phrase cast down is the word for despair or depression. Why are you in a state of despair? Why are you depressed? That's his first question. His second question is just as important, and that is, why are you disquieted, soul? Why are you disquieted within me? The definition means there is a loud hum, mm, something, there, it's, it's turmoil that's going on inside this person's soul. It means to rage. 
So what we see in the psalmist here is that not only is he depressed, but his, his depression has something to do with anger. So he's very angry and his depression is, in my opinion, and what we're looking at, a consequence of his mishandling of anger. So the psalmist is obviously emotionally conf conflicted. And so we need to see how mishandling anger can certainly lead to depression. And in, in, in extreme cases, anger can become so violent in a depressed person that they become either suicidal or homicidal. Uh, we see this in Cain. Cain was so angry that not only did he want to kill his brother, he actually did kill his brother. And this anger in him was not managed. It was not addressed. Even when God said, why has your countenance fallen? Why are, why are you so angry? He wouldn't hear it. He was overcome with this violent anger. So we have to be able to see how anger may be connected to depression. It's not always the case, but in some cases it is an anger problem or a mishandling of anger. And I, I said this last week that the conflict avoidant person is more likely to stuff anger because of a number of reasons, but, but because they don't deal with it appropriately, they don't look at it, they don't embrace it, they don't understand it, they don't communicate about it, they don't address the object of their anger, because sometimes that's necessary, they just stuff it, they absorb it, but they smile. And they put on this, they play a role of the happy Christian, but inside they're dying and they're very angry, they're very upset. But some people, like myself, cannot identify it as anger. I remember thinking, I remember the Lord convicting me of anger. And I was thinking, well, I'm not angry. I'm not an angry person. I'm laid back. Until the Lord lifted the veil and I saw how ugly and violent my anger was. And I saw how because I did not know how to manage anger, I was depressed a lot. Now, anger, I had, I had three primary contributors to my depression. Anger, fear, and shame. And that was a concoction that was overpowering to me. And only Jesus could come in and do something about that. I had no capacity to overcome that on my own. But in this case, in Psalm 42, we, we can see where anger is certainly connected to this depression. Now, no, notice again, when we look at this, notice what the psalmist is doing. He's saying, why are you, who's he talking to? Why are you depressed, soul? Why are you so angry, soul? Put your hope in God. And so here we see some good self-talk some really good self-talk. And for the depressed person, paying attention to self-talk is very important if you're going to understand depression and overcome depression. Because as Paul David Tripp said, no one influences you more than you do because no one talks to you as much as you do. And whether you know it or not, you have recurring, repeated messages going on inside of you that you may not have ever articulated. And these messages are not very nice. In, in many cases, they are like bullies, like tyrants. So I, I recommend that people begin to pay attention to their self-talk. Write it down. What are you saying to yourself, especially when you fail? What are you saying? Write that down. Say it out loud. Hear yourself say it. Because something in you will cringe when you hear it. Because you know that is an absolute lie. Why am I believing that? But here's the problem. You believe it. You believe it. So you can't just say, oh, okay, I'm not going to believe that anymore. <laughs> it's not that easy. 
these, the loyalty that you have to your beliefs and the emotions that are attached to that, it's a powerful combination. So it's going to take some very courageous steps of obedience to come out of that and to break free of that kind of self-talk. Now, counseling yourself is a very biblical concept. Let's look, just look at one example. This is Psalm 103. You're probably familiar with it. Where David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now, that's, he's talking to himself. He's saying, here's what you need to do. Get up. Open your mouth. Bless the Lord. Well, I don't feel like, don't worry about that. Just bless him. Make yourself do it, soul. Then he says this, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all his benefits. Now, I'm a firm believer that anytime the Bible says do this, it's because we have the tendency to not do that. And every time the Bible says don't do this, it's because we have the tendency to do that. So, so when we hear don't forget all his benefits, guess what we are likely to do? And he just lists a few in this one. He's, he's talking to himself. He's reminding himself of the benefits. Verse 3, who forgives all, say all, your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of benefits. David said, pay attention. So you need to remember this. This is who you are. This is what's real. This is what's true. There's a situation in 1 Samuel 30 where the Amalekites had destroyed the city of Ziglag and took David's wives captive. And the text says that David wept until he had no more power to weep. Now that's a low place. But then we read this. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, meaning they were grief-stricken, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. David was greatly distressed at one point. He had every reason to be greatly distressed. There's a lot of real things happening in his life. You know, people want to kill you. That's a pretty serious thing. But he chose to encourage himself in the Lord. In other words, he reset his focus. He could have thought about all that. He could have said, oh, woe is me. I don't deserve this. I'm trying to do the right thing. These people are crazy. He, he, didn't, he reset his focus. He anchored himself with the reality that God is faithful. Even in these horrible circumstances, in other words, he told himself the truth. He told himself the truth. And so when you see the psalmist in 42.5 coaching himself, he says, don't do that. Do this. Don't be depressed. Don't be angry. Put your hope in God. In fact, the implication of the verse is that hope is the antidote for depression and, and anger in this particular case. So again, the depressed person needs to insert hope if he's or she's going to come out of depression. So we have to speak the truth to ourselves. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves. We have to biblically counsel ourselves and remind ourselves of what is true. So even though David felt, or I'm sorry, like the, the psalmist here in 42.5, even though he felt he didn't have any hope, well, maybe he did, we don't know. The fact was he actually did have hope. So as I said before, this passage compels us to ask ourselves questions. Am I, am I angry? And if I'm angry, why am I angry? I need to think through that. I need to write some things down. I need to maybe talk to someone else about this. But I need to get 
a really good handle on my own anger and why I'm angry. So the person may have a good reason to be angry, might have a righteous anger, but because he or she doesn't know how to handle it, they mishandle even good anger, they mishandle it, it becomes problematic. I want to look at Jeremiah's depression. But I'm going to read a lot. Of, I've put all this in your notes. It's worth reading. I want you to listen and just observe this man and how he is viewing his circumstances. And then we're going to see a dramatic change. So let's start in verse 1. I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he, here's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a circle around. Every time you, I read the word he, I want you to draw a circle around it. Uh, verse 3. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He has been to me a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. He has caused the arrow of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day long. It goes on. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drink wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. Now he begins to shift. Verse 17. Seems like he's talking directly to him now. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood of the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. Now, this is a very depressing commentary on the prophet Jeremiah. But this is how he felt. This is how he interpreted his reality. It's a, a passage of lament and grief, uh, grief, it's also a description of depression. So Jeremiah allowed his emotions to define not only what was happening to him, but who was doing it to him, why it was happening. And he placed all this blame on God and was convinced that God was the one who had wrecked his life. God was the reason he was so depressed. But as we read the next verses, which are more familiar to us, notice this significant change. It's miraculous. Listen, verse 21. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And as I read this, I'm thinking, what? Where's that other guy? Like, this is not the same guy, is it? The same guy who said he has removed my strength and my hope. They've perished. They're gone. My hope is gone. Now the Lord is good to those who wait for him. He is my hope. I should hope in him. But what we see is somehow a change of focus, a 
a change in worldview, a change in the lens of perception, so that now Jeremiah is contradicting what he said earlier. He's absolutely contradicting himself. Now he's saying, wait a minute, when I think about it, when I recall what I actually know to be true, then I have hope. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is good. In fact, the reason I'm still alive is because all of that that I just described hasn't killed me. It's because he's merciful. It's because he's good. He's my portion. And you can almost feel Jeremiah's faith increasing, his hope increasing. It's like, wait a minute, that's not, that's not true. That's not who God is. He's not against me. He's for me. I think this, this story serves as an example of what we usually term mental repentance. When you think of repentance, many times I think of outward repentance. You know, stop doing that, start doing this. But what we're talking about here, and especially when we're dealing with emotional struggles, we're talking about repenting within our thinking, re renewing our mind, changing what we are thinking and what we are believing. That is where the work has to be done. Uh, we can see this when Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Listen as I read this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according, according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for, number one, pulling down strongholds, number two, casting down arguments, and then every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, I'll just tell you, I memorized that passage when I was 18 years old. And I could quote it right now. I've, I've memorized, I've known that passage all my life. But I can tell you something, until you have felt that the breath of the enemy on your life, if you, if, until you've been up close and personal with death, with a threat like depression and these overpowering lies, you don't know what that means. This is a spiritual battle where we come face to face with an enemy, but it's not flesh and blood. It is in our thinking and in our beliefs. So notice Paul says we are demolishing or pulling down strongholds. This is defined as a fortress or something that is fortified or well entrenched, uh, possibly imprisoning us. And so basic, basically what, what I think Paul is saying is we have been imprisoned by consistently believing certain things to where it has been fortified. We are well entrenched in these ways of thinking and we are held by them. Paul says we've got to demolish that. That's spiritual warfare. He goes on to say casting down, same word, demolishing arguments. Now this word is imaginations or reasoning. The New Living uh, translates this strongholds of human reasoning. And so I can imagine Jeremiah reasoning like Gideon did, the Lord is with you. Oh yeah? Well, if it doesn't make sense, look at my circumstances. It doesn't compute. It's not reasonable that God is with me because look at my circumstances. That is the type of thinking Paul is referring to that we have reasoned ourselves with human reason. We have, some people have really just kind of exited the faith with human reasoning. It's a powerful opponent. And Paul says we have got to bring that down. And then he says, really, not just arguments and imagination and strongholds, everything, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, I want you to notice this line. What Paul is saying is anything that exalts itself on top of the line, above the knowledge of God, anything, doesn't matter. Could be your selfishness, could be the enemy's lie, doesn't matter what it is. Anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God has to be brought 
under submission or obedience to Christ. Now, I can't tell you what that is for you, and you probably can't tell me what that is for me, but the Holy Spirit knows exactly what I have allowed to supersede God's knowledge, to usurp His authority, to be in a higher position than the Word of God. Whatever that is, Paul says, that has to come down. And you are the one who has to do it. Nobody's coming to rescue you. I can tell you that is a very discouraging statement, but that is a hope-filled reality. Because once you realize, oh, nobody's coming to rescue me, and God is with me, and I have choices, I begin to pray, Lord, strengthen me to do the right thing. Strengthen me to obey your word, to look those lies right in the face and say, You're, you've got to come under obedience to God. That is the spiritual warfare component of these types of struggles. Now, I'm very, I want to be very clear. This is not demonic. Depression is not demonic. That's not what we're talking about. But when it comes to addressing these lies and these strongholds in our life that we have believed and based our lives on for maybe decades, that battle is very intense, very spiritual, and the opponent does not want you to be free from that fortress that you've been in for many years. He is going to do everything he can to strengthen those lies, and you're going to have to, in faith, believe what God has said. But here's the thing. We don't even have to do that by ourselves. When I said nobody's coming to rescue us, somebody's already come to rescue us. Jesus is with you. He is present in your struggle. Now, I've said before that feelings are not dependable. Uh, they can misrepresent reality. This is a hard lesson to learn for a feelings-oriented person, but it's a lesson that must be learned. I think this is why we're taught in Scripture to walk by faith and not by sight or by our senses. We know that feelings are connected to what we believe, and many times a person is not really aware of what they believe. We act on our beliefs. Um, I've said so many times, you know, Paul said the just shall live by faith. We all really live by faith. We all live by what we truly believe. And when push comes to shove, you and I will we will act on what we really believe, even if it goes against what we know intellectually to be true. So I want to look at Peter's story. Now we can assume that Peter was depressed after he denied the Lord. Um, he goes into hiding. He didn't just feel like a failure. I mean, he failed miserably. So this was his reality. He turned to his old occupation. Maybe he gave up on kingdom mission. I don't know. But we can certainly assume that he felt unworthy to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with these other disciples. Maybe he couldn't face them because of, of the shame that he had in his life. But I want us to notice how Jesus restores him in John's gospel. You know the scene, they're out fishing and Jesus appears on the beach. He cooks them breakfast. They gather together. Peter says, oh, that's the Lord. They, I mean, it's a big, exciting event. And, and Jesus is present. Now note, this is not the first time that Peter has seen Jesus after the resurrection. He's seen him before, but they never talked about this. But this morning is gonna be a little different. So they're having breakfast. I'm sure Peter's feeling like, oh man, I'm feeling like I'm being, I'm one of the guys again. And Jesus brings up the subject. Peter, do you love me? I can, I can feel Peter cringing on the inside. Like, seriously? Like, you want to bring that up here? Like, I, I don't want to talk about that. I want that, 
to be in my past. I don't want to have to bring that up now, especially in front of these guys. Peter, do you love me? And you know that story, right? You know I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? You know. So here's what I want to suggest. We have to face our failures. Or whatever the root of our depression is, we have to face it. If it's left to us, like Peter, we will not face it. We won't bring it up. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. I can't tell you the conversations I've been in with people, especially who are dealing with some shame and, and anger from the past, and I say, hey, can we talk about that? And they're like, I don't, want, I don't even want to think about it, much less talk about it. And Peter's in this situation where Jesus is bringing it up, and he won't let it go. It's not that Jesus was rubbing this failure in Peter's face. Jesus knew that if he didn't face his failure, he would never be able to move on. Wouldn't, he won't be able to do it. He would live in that state of shame, live in that state of depression. So Jesus is drawing him out with a question. He's drawing him out. And so in the context of depression, we cannot continue to bury or ignore the root problem, whatever it is. Facing the truth is necessary for healing. And just as Jesus, Jesus confessed three times, I'm sorry, just as Peter confessed three times that he loved him, we, we're going to have to confess some, some real, real things, some true things, some positive things. Because I've asked myself many times when, Peter, when I imagine Peter around that fire the night of the, Jesus' crucifixion, um, did, Jesus, did Peter love Jesus in that moment? And my mentor always said, Tim, there's always two, two answers to a question. The one that satisfies you and the, the one that satisfies me. And the answer that satisfies me is, yes, yes, Peter uh, loved Jesus in that moment. But he loved himself more. He had both of those things going on in him. And that's the case for you and me. We love God, but we also self-protect. We love God. We trust God, but we also don't trust God. We want to please God, but we also don't want to please God. And that tension is constantly, Paul, uh, Paul said to the Galatians, that battle between the flesh and the spirit is constant, never ceases, never ends, never stops. So Peter had to revalidate his faith. Now, you would think Peter would be so happy. He must be the happiest guy in the whole world. But he's not. Because they get up, and they're walking down the beach, and Peter looks behind and sees John and says, Hey, Jesus, what's going to happen to him? It's like, like, seriously? Like, I just restored you. I think what's going on with Peter is, is a little competition, a little comparison, wondering. I mean, just think about it. John? Well, John didn't deny the Lord. John was at the cross. He's the only one at the cross. John was given the honor of caring for Jesus' mom. All that was happening while Peter was somewhere else. And so Peter's like, what about John? It's like, where do I measure up here? And Jesus, I mean, he just nipped it in the bud, right? He said, that is not your business. I'm paraphrasing all this. You read the story. That is not your business. You are thinking about the wrong things. Now, this is not the first time Jesus talked about to Peter about him thinking the wrong things. You may recall this. And, uh, Matthew 16, he said, who do men say that I am? You're, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Flesh and blood hasn't shown you that. The Father revealed that to you. Now, now that you know all that, let me just tell you what's happening. They're going to kill me when I go to Jerusalem. And he said, no, they won't. Not if I'm there. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you are not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. And that somehow fits within our topic tonight. So let me end by giving some practical steps, practical things someone can do to uh, move away from depression. Number one, uh, pay attention to some practical areas. Are you getting enough rest? Are you sleeping? Are you getting enough exercise? Or are you exercising? Are you on a good diet? Is your diet contributing to your emotional situation? Are you interacting with other people or are you isolating? And so these are very important practical things that we need to check in our own life. And if you're walking with someone, check that, have them check that in their lives. So when it comes to the spiritual aspect of this, number one, I have to assume personal responsibility for the things I'm aware of. I must do what I know to do, the next thing. I must focus on controlling what I have control over, not on what I don't have control over. Another thing is I, I need to identify any way in which I have sinned in this process. Was, was I avoiding responsibility? Was I being passive? Was I giving in to fear, fear of rejection, fear of disappointment, fear of disapproval? Was I mishandling anger? Was I stuffing it? brooding over it? So these are questions I have to look and say, okay, where did I go off? Where did I mis, uh, mishandle this? Where did I disobey God when, in, in what he's told me to do in his word? Another thing is to choose repentance, a different path. This is what Jeremiah did. This is what the psalmist did in, in Psalm 42. This is what Peter did. Choosing repentance, acknowledging it before God, asking for forgiveness, committing this new task to him and trusting him to help you. And then I need to identify the biblical replacement for what I did not handle well. So we need to search God for these replacements. So if I was giving in to fear and that was my downfall, then what am I to do now? What's the replacement of fear. If it's anger, what's my replacement? If it's shame, what is my replacement? I have to have a goal. I have to see where I am heading. And God, God's word is a light to our path in that way. And so we trust him. We choose to obey his word. And then we are to focus on God's promises. We renew our mind to what he says is true. We become thankful for what we know we have and not complain about what we don't have. We are focused like Jeremiah on the goodness of God, the nearness of God. We trust him and we pray for his strength to obey and to act for his glory. And then we focus, um, we, we ask good questions. And so what am I feeling? Some people have a hard time identifying that. Uh, what particular thing is upsetting me? You say, well, I'm upset about my job. Well, no, let's go a little deeper. What part of your job upsets you? And you might find what person on the job upsets you and what about that person upsets you? We're drilling down to get some really concrete answers to these questions rather than broad brushing it. Have you experienced any losses? Are you angry about anything? And how are you interpreting your circumstances. We remember Jeremiah's experience. And now that I recognize how I'm interpreting this, be honest, then I can say, now, what is the truth? What is the truth? Okay. And I know I'm going long here. Wow. Way long. Uh, but then notice this little chart. This is just a simple exercise that you or someone can do where you list on the left side of the column, 
what it is you are feeling or what you are perceiving or how you're interpreting reality and be gut level honest about this. Don't use your Sunday school brain. Use your true gut honesty to say, I feel God has forsaken me. That's what I really believe is happening. And write that down and then look for the truth in God's word to counter that or to replace that. And then I've listed just a few renewing the mind passages for you. These are all related to uh, depression and how to manage depression. So I would recommend you look through those if you are um, in that place where you need to move out of depression. Let me pray for you before um, Jason comes. Father, thank you for this opportunity. You know the complications that we face. You know the ignorance that is in us. You know how we need you, Lord, to hold our hand and to lead us. So we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Went long. Went way long. No, 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 no. The more you talk, I cut into your time. The less I got to (laughs) talk. No, it was good. It's great. That was Mike too. No, it was Paul. Okay. Um, a couple quick points of of, of clarity. Um, I I think I understood you correctly. I know we gave an example at the beginning of a sinful choice that led to depression, but then as as we kind of walk through it, we uh, we noticed. Uh, a number of other emotions uh, that are tied up in there that may not necessarily be tied to sin. Uh, there was there was fear. Uh, there was some undealt with uh, maybe some circumstances that had applied to us, and then we ended up believing lies as a result of that, and all of that get gets mixed up in there. Yeah. So, would I be correct in saying that we we wouldn't say that uh, all depression is a, is a result of sin, but rather right. it. it most of the time, it, it, it's, it's, and, and I, I would also just continue and say, like, like I, I think even the sin that we've done itself, most often what has led to the depression are the lies that we're believing that's wrapped up in that in terms of where our forgiveness is, where our identity is, and all of those things. Yeah, and I would say yes to that question. When you zoom in, though, um, I disobeyed God's word, but I didn't know I was disobeying God's word. It's like breaking the law and you don't know that that the law is on the books. So I was living out of my own resources. So in that sense, I mean, you could split hairs on that. That would be, in a sense, sinful because I wasn't trusting God. But not in the sense that I know God wants me to do that and I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to. So it's almost like a omission, a yeah. subtle, a subtle form. Of that. Yeah, but the, the the practical implications of that is, is in a counseling situation and yes. how how you address individuals versus uh, looking them right in the eyes and go, hey, let's talk about where you've sinned, versus yeah. uh, 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 being sensitive and and like you said, hey, let let's write down. When that darkness comes, let's write that down so we can name it, and and then we can begin to address those that darkness with the truth of God's word. And yes, theologically, we would both say, yeah, yeah, that, that's a sin of omission and commission, right. Uh, right? That sort of deal. But in in terms of of how we deal and how we counsel with people, uh, so I, I just wanted to bring clarity to that because in our initial example, uh, certainly our own sin can lead us to depression, and that's the cycle that we went through. Uh, but I just wanted to point out uh, that we're not saying that all sin is, or all depression is a result of sin. Most often, it, it is it is a result of the lies that we are believing that's wrapped up in all of that. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, I continue to love uh, your your press on this issue and repeated examples um, because you illustratively said, all right, here is the line and and no one is coming to help you. You're going to have to deal with this. 
um, in, in where we're placing our values and what we're believing, um, and no one's coming to help you. But then we circled around and said, well, yeah, Jesus has come to help you, and he is help, um, and that's what these are examples of. But Jesus is going to make you deal with what you're actually believing. And so oftentimes, when I've counseled, and uh, right when, when, when you open up those deepest, darkest parts uh, to me, and you say, I've been praying that God would take this away, um, and, and knowing that, yes, that's an earnest prayer, uh, but in all sincerity, if, if the Lord has 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 us at this spot guys most often he doesn't just poof take things away he makes us deal with them and and deal with the the lies and the hurt that we're believing and then answer that with scripture and so uh yeah the the question would be yes how does jesus help us yes he is our helper but how does he help us that's what i'm scribbling in my notes is like mm-hmm. yes that's that's exactly right it's it's right there in that jesus doesn't uh i mean he can okay but uh man in the in the ebb and flow of life, he doesn't just wave a magic wand and make things go away. And, and that is so much a part of this, this mental health wrestling that we do um, in saying, man, I've been praying to God, but it hasn't just disappeared. Um, so, And let me just say, the, the reason I press that part, nobody's coming to rescue, I've talked to so many people who they have a victim mentality and they feel like, I can't do any, like, why do you want me to do something? I need somebody to help me. I either need, you know, medical help or I need you to help me somehow. Can't you help me? And that feeling of I'm, I don't have any choice here. I need somebody to do it for me. And I think what, what we're pre- stressing is when we, God helps us by instructing us and as he, he strengthens us to obey him, as we obey him, he blesses that, and it moves us toward freedom. Yeah, it's it's funny that I referenced uh, Judges 6 in, in Gideon tonight because uh, there was a particular moment in my life when uh, the Lord used that passage uh, very instructively because uh, uh, what you realize about Gideon in Judges 6, remember, he's in the wine press and he's afraid. Uh, and the Lord comes and reveals himself, right? Causes fire to come out of a rock. The angel of the Lord was there. You know what the next thing the angel of the Lord told him to do? Now go tear down the altar in your hometown. Uh, that's that's the, the false altar to the, uh, to the Asherah and to Baal. All right, so uh, the, God showed up, but then God told him to go do something that was really scary, Okay, Uh, for someone that's hiding in a wine press to say the next thing to do is tear down the altar in your hometown. And and as the story progresses, it's the same thing. It's right. Your army's too big. Let's make it smaller. Your army's still too big. Let's make it smaller. All right. Now take this 300 and go against 135,000. That's the reason that the Lord was willing to continue to meet him in that spot. And I was just talking to Tim right before what I love about that passage with Gideon is what it overwhelmingly shows, what we're describing right here, um, is, is that our, uh, I, I want you to notice the way that, that God showed up and drew near to Gideon. And then, then there's that whole fleece story, right? He puts the fleece out and he, he says, make, make all the ground wet and the fleece dry and that happens. And then he says, we'll reverse it. And, and God does all of that for Gideon. Here's why, because there's a phrase in the New Testament, Mark, uh, uh, I think it's chapter nine, uh, where, where a father whose his son needs to get healed by Jesus and, and the father says, Jesus, if you could heal him. And, and Jesus replies, could, like, you gotta believe that I can. And the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay, that's what's happening in Gideon in that story there where God is willing to meet Gideon in the midst of that fight of faith and God is willing to encourage his faith but he still makes Gideon takes those scary steps of faith okay 
right? So the way that God showed up was in the fleece or in causing fire to come out of a rock. The way that God didn't show up was just poof, make 135,000 people go away. Right? There was still a battle. All right? So we've said all that to say like, like the Lord needs us in those moments of faith because he does want to give you the victory, but it's in addressing the issues, not in just poof, make it all go away. All right, Tim, I've taken up all our time now. I did my best. <laughs> All right. Uh, any quick questions from the floor? We do have two minutes. I don't even know if I want to call on you now, Paul. <laughs> no. In today's world, with the situation the way it is now, could the situation in Israel be causing people depression? Because I've talked to several that even when you say, Yeah, if you, if you couldn't hear, Paul was just referencing our, uh, our news and what's going on culturally. And, and the question was, uh, specifically this one is what's going on with Israel, but, it, but it's a larger question, right? And that is, do, do the things of the world and the scariness and the fear, does that cause depression? Right. Uh, and I think the answer in everything that we're pressing into is, yes, how, how we are addressing uh, fears and uh, how I mean, there are a million things, right, that make us fearful in terms of the economy, in terms of uh, right. We just went through a pandemic and so many uh, up, uh, things were turned upside down. And when you look at all the statistics, guys, of, of mental health crisis that we are in the midst of, um, I, we saw the statistic last week, right? And that was pre-pandemic in the United States. It was like 8% uh, had uh, depression. Uh, and through uh, COVID on the other side, it, it rose to like 25%. And then it's it's gone nothing but continued to go up since then uh, to where now the current stat is even on the other side of the pandemic, it's at like 33%. We're talking about one in every three Americans is reaching the point of clinical depression where they have entered into this cycle. And so much of it has to do with fear, anxiety, and believing lies and how we handle believing those lies. Again, we gave a disclaimer at the beginning of last time, if you weren't here and saw that, we passed out a chart that, th that there are medical reasons for depression and that there's a whole side of that, but we were dealing with uh, uh, in the in the biblical lane, in in terms of our thought process and answering and dealing with uh, sin and lies and those things, and so that's what we're addressing tonight. And and with that, yes, uh, we are an anxious culture, uh, and uh, the more and more that that truth has moved from being in God, that God is the holder of truth, that we can look to Him and that we can trust Him, and and truth has moved inside the individual. That is the way we argue uh, and, and move as a culture. That's the feeling-based chart that we saw tonight, right? If truth is in here, then truth is con completely uh, conditional upon my feelings at that moment. Uh, and that's a terrible spot for truth to be. And we're seeing uh, some of the major consequences of that. All right, let me pray for us. Uh, and then we are out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for uh, the example of scripture, the way that uh, the psalmist and, and David spoke to their soul and, and were able to uh, refocus and, and fix our eyes uh, upon you uh, and upon uh, the fact that we have so much to be thankful for. And, and you are on your throne and you are in Thank control. You. And we can look to you and we can press into you. There is, there is no God like you. Mm -hmm. There is no one who cares for our soul like Thank you. You. you are near to us in the midst of the fight of faith. You are near to us. You even love us enough to cause us to walk through that fight of faith, God to be able to see and to know you and your nearness. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.